If we could, and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, the title of our message this morning is The Final Call. The Final Call. Happy Palm Sunday, by the way, to everybody. Palm Sunday, of course, is when Jesus uh, rode into Jerusalem and proclaimed his messianic credentials to the nation. Very big event in biblical history, and here we're today starting to study another major event, which was the flood. We're continuing on with our verse-by-verse teaching through the book of Genesis, and the first part of the book, as we have studied, is the beginning of the human race. That particular section, chapters 1 through 11, has four events. Number one, creation, God's perfect design for the world, chapters 1 and 2. Number two, the fall, what went wrong? Well, the fall went wrong. And yet, through the fall, we have hope because there's coming one, a Messiah to fix the problem. Genesis 3 verse 15 tells us that. So we've covered creation, we've covered the fall, and we have been teaching recently on the flood. Having completed events before the flood, Genesis 6, now we actually move into the flood itself, Genesis 7. So notice this, we're actually moving here. We're actually able to change the page, amen? Here's uh, an outline that we can use as we start to move through Genesis chapter 7. We have God's instructions to enter the ark, verses 1 through 4. The actual entrance into the ark, verses 5 through 12. Then God seals the door shut. Verses 13 through 16. And then finally, at the very end of the chapter, verses 17 through 24, you get the description of the flood itself. But notice, if you will, God's instructions to enter the ark, verses 1 through 4. Notice, if you will, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. We have the instructions now to enter the ark. It's time, in other words... We see that Noah is to enter the ark with his household, eight total on the ark, including his wife and his three sons and their wives. We have made a reference to the fact in our study that it's interesting how God's blessing upon Noah translated into a blessing on his whole family. There's an interesting verse in Acts 16, verse 31, where the Philippian jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved in your household. And your household is the interesting part of that. The salvation of this Philippian jailer opened the door to family members being saved. Because when the leader of the family is walking with the Lord, there's a spillover effect on the whole family. Now, don't get me wrong, God has no grandchildren. Every person must exercise their own faith in Jesus Christ to become um, a member of God's family. But at the same time, it is interesting how God works many times, how when the husband gets saved, the wife will soon thereafter get saved. And there's a blessing to the children. They now become aware of and and in some cases open to the gospel. That's the kind of thing you see happening here in verse 1. As Noah was under the blessing of God and that had a positive spillover effect to his whole family. See, it's not just about you and it's not just about me. 
There are others that God wants to bless through us, many times members of our own family. And you'll also notice that only Noah, as it says here, was righteous before the Lord. How many people were on the earth at this time? Well, we know from Genesis 6 verse 1, the prior chapter, that men began to multiply on the face of the earth. According to the scientist Henry Morris in his commentary on Genesis, he postulates that there could have been at least 7 billion people on the earth. And if he's right about that, boy, isn't that a tragic thing? Of all of these people, only Noah was right with the Lord. Only Noah was righteous. Which raises another question, what makes someone right before God? I mean, how did Noah achieve this righteousness before God? Was it because he obeyed? No. His obedience didn't make him righteous. Rather, he obeyed because he already was righteous. We know from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. And then verse 7 says, by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. Noah believed the promises of God. Faith alone in the promises of God is what makes someone right before God. That's what gave Noah standing. It's according to Hebrews 11 verse 4, what made Abel right with God. It's what made Adam and Eve right with God after sin. When they by faith received the provision of God, those garments of skin. And eventually, we're going to be getting to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Not today, don't, don't panic. But it says there, and it gives really the seminal or key verse on how human beings become right with God. It will say in Genesis 15, verse 6, Abram believed the Lord. And he, that's God, credited it to him as righteousness. There's going to come a point in Abram's life where God will take him outside and show him the stars. And he said, as these stars are innumerable, so will your descendants be. And what an absurd promise that looked like, given his advanced age and the advanced age of his wife, who at that time was named Sarai, who later became Sarah. Paul the Apostle in Galatians 3 verse 16 says God's promise was not just for seed in general, but it was also for seed individually or individual. That's what we call in language a collective singular. It's a word that can be used in the plural and also in the singular. It's it's the same noun. It's like a lot of people have come up to me and said, hey, Andy, did you get your hair cut? And by the way, I I don't get my hair cut anymore for purposes of fashion. I gave up on that a long time ago. I do it for expediency and convenience so I don't have to hassle with it when it grows back in two weeks. This gives me an additional two weeks. So as I told my wife, who really doesn't like my haircut, I said, don't worry, you'll be over it in two weeks. (laughs) And that's just way too much information, isn't it? (laughs) But the reason I bring up hair is when someone says, hey Andy, you got your haircut, I don't say, oh, which hair are you speaking of? Because hair can be used as a singular, but it can also be used collectively. And that's how the word seed works. God promised Abram seed, descendants, but he also promised him a seed. And through that individual seed, Jesus Christ would come the redemption of planet Earth. 
And it seemed uh, ridiculous, it seemed impossible, but Genesis 15 verse 6 says, Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Why does it say, at least in the NIV, credited? Because Abram received the righteousness of God on credit. Now we all understand credit cards, amen? We love credit cards. Because credit cards give us goodies before, before payday. That's what Abram received. He received the benefit before the payment had been made. The payment wouldn't be made for 2,000 years. Later until Jesus shed his blood. And then after that rose from the dead. That's how all people are made right with God. They believe the disclosure of God concerning the Messiah. It's just in the Old Testament they look forward. They didn't know his name, Jesus. Today, 2,000 years after the fact, we look backward and we do know his name, Jesus, but we're all saved the exact same way individually by trusting in that promise, which is what we call the gospel. This is why Noah could be called righteous before God. He had exercised faith in that promise. I believe that that promise, it goes back to Genesis 3.15, that promise, cycling back here for a minute. But I believe this group here, prior to the flood, all knew this promise very well. That's why they're all misnaming their children. Because they all thought that their child would be the Messiah. That's how excited they were about it. Uh, This is why uh, Adam and Eve thought Cain was the Messiah. And boy, what a disappointment that turned out to be. Uh, Cain was not, not, not only was he not the Messiah, he was the world's first murderer. This is why Noah's father, Lamech, as we have made reference to in Genesis 5, 28 and 29, said of Noah's birth, this one will redeem us from the curse. Sensing the role that Noah would play in human history, but, but overstating things, thinking that Noah was the Messiah. And that's why we're going to see Genesis 9, the drunkenness of Noah. It's going to show us that God used him greatly, but he was no Messiah. There must be someone yet future coming. And as these Old Testament patriarchs, pre-flood, post-flood, believe that promise, the transferred righteousness of God was transferred to them at the point of faith. It's the same thing that happens to you when you become a Christian. You trust in the promise of God, the gospel. You're just looking backward, whereas they were all looking forward. You go to verses uh, 2 and 3, and it says, You shall take with you... Of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and a female, also of the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. It's interesting that you start seeing a smaller category of animals than what is commonly depicted. This idea that Noah put every single animal on the ark is not what the Bible teaches. We made a little reference to this last time, but on the ark there were no sea creatures, no insects, no plants, based on the best descriptions we have in the Bible. Our verse here, there might not even have been seven pairs, perhaps just seven in some circumstances. In some circumstances, the animals were just clean animals. Animals of their kind were brought on the ark, just a dog. You don't need every kind of dog. Perhaps animals were on the ark that were not fully grown, and perhaps animals were on the ark in a state of hibernation. Given the size of the ark, and if a cubit is the length from one's elbow to one's middle finger, then the ark probably stood about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. 
capable of holding 125,000 animals. And John Woodmorapi, in his book, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study, which I'll recommend to you because I know a lot of you have engineering background, science background, and he's of that variety. He goes through all of this data and explains how fitting the animals in the ark was no big deal at all. The ark was capable of holding 125,000 animals and on the high side there could have been as high as and maybe even uh, maybe that's an exaggerated number or a conservative number I should say 16,000 animals. 16,000 animals on an ark capable of holding 125,000 animals. Now why even bring up things like this? Well, there's an interesting verse in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and verse 12, where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus at night. I call this the Nick at night conversation. And it says in John 3, verse 2, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In other words, if you can't accept the simple account of Noah's Ark and you want to come up with all of these objections and you want to disbelieve God at that point when you don't have to, then why would you believe God on things you can't see? I mean, if I can't believe God on simple things like this, measurements and volume, why in the world would I trust God on heaven and hell? Angels and demons. Sin and salvation, things that I can't see. So that's why these handling of these things is actually a big deal. Because your attitude towards these things will determine your attitude towards the rest of the book, you see. And so these kind of pictures here, as I mentioned last time, really don't help us very much. With all of the animals sticking their heads out and the, look at the orangutan, he's about to have his poor arm pulled out of its socket and as evangelicals we make a bunch of pictures like this in cartoons and we open the door to secular criticism because that's what the secularist thinks when they think of Noah's Ark they're not thinking of John Woodmorapi's Noah's Ark a feasibility study they think we're just a bunch of crazy people that believe things like this because there's no way all of the animals could have fit in the ark well the bible never says that just like when we were in the Garden of Eden studying it back in Genesis 2 and it says there that God brought to Adam the animals that Adam would name. And people say, well, you mean to tell me that Adam named all of the animals in a 24-hour period? Ridiculous. Well, that's not even what the Bible says. The Bible never says Noah, excuse me, Adam went around and named every single animal. What it says is he named the ones that God brought to him. And so we need to be careful with how we're handling God's word and we want to do it accurately and we don't do it, want to do it in a way that's going to open us up to secular criticism and secular attack. I mean, the secularists are already doing that anyway. Why make it easy on them? So it's interesting, uh, there's no problem with the, no, with the animals on the ark. Um, by the way, if the flood was local and not global, why would you put animals on the ark at all? Let me just get rid of this picture, it's so bad. I mean, you could just tell the animals to get on another, you know, scatter and move them onto a different range where the flood wouldn't come. Why would you put birds on the ark? There's birds on the ark. There's no need to do that if the flood didn't cover the whole world. But as this is happening, something very interesting takes place in verse 4, and you start seeing a number. And there's a lot of numbers here in Genesis 7. One number is 8 on the ark. Another number is it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Another number is the flood lasted 150 days. And it's important to keep these numbers distinct. And here you run into your first number, there's seven days. 
And notice what it says in verse 4. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth and 40 days and 40 nights and I will blot out. Now I'll be showing you later that this word blot out means to erase. Another translation is cancel, as in cancel culture. This society was canceling God, Genesis 6. And so God says, okay, I'll cancel you. Don't think that God doesn't have some divine sarcasm in how he works here. The cancel culture movement in the United States today and the world is not getting away with anything. Because if they're not right with God, they're going to be canceled just like they're trying to cancel us. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth, and for forty days and forty nights I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Now notice it says seven days. Noah, you've got seven days before we get forty days and forty nights of a torrential downpour. Now the big question is, well, why did God give Noah this seven-day grace period? It doesn't say, but some guesses are this was given so Noah can make some last minute preparations. However, I did find this very interesting quote from Arnold Fruchtenbaum's commentary on the book of Genesis, which I'll recommend to you, very good commentary. And Fruchtenbaum writes this, according to rabbinic tradition, Arnold Fruchtenbaum being a Hebrew Christian scholar, according to Rabbinic tradition, the reason for the seven-day delay was to allow seven days for the mourning of Methuselah, who had just died. At any rate, the rain was to continue for 40 days and 40 nights once it began. Why a delay of seven days? Perhaps it was to mourn the death of Methuselah. Because Methuselah's name, remember, means when he dies, it shall be sent. The date of judgment was connected to the death of Methuselah. Now, that's very interesting because Methuselah was the oldest living man. He lived to the ripe old age of 969 years. And it shows you the long-suffering of God for God to attach judgment to the date of a man when that man was the oldest man that ever lived. That shows you that God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and he is reluctant to judge. Now, could you imagine if you were the parents of Methuselah? Think how nervous you would be with a name like that. By the way, that name was given to him from Enoch. And Enoch, remember, raptured? Enoch was a prophet who in Jude, I think it's verse 14 and then 15, made a prophecy about the second coming. And Enoch in this name also seems to have made a prophecy concerning the flood coming by giving Methuselah this name, when he dies it shall be sent. So every time that kid scraped his knees or got the sniffles, I guess they all got nervous. But he grew into full stature, grew into 969 years. He died. And so perhaps, and there's no way to prove this, it's just a rabbinic tradition. It doesn't rise to the same level of scriptural authority, but perhaps the seven days was there not just to give Noah a chance for final preparations, but it was there to memorialize Methuselah just like we had a memorial service here at our church yesterday perhaps something like that was going on for Methuselah and that's why I have entitled this message the final call seven days and judgment is going to come this is the last train out in other words Noah had been faithfully preaching this message, we believe, for at least 120 years. Genesis 6, verse 3, all of that is gone, and you've got seven days, and it's over. And sometimes, you know, I wonder, when you look at the events of our world and the things that are happening, 
are we in the final call as well? I mean, could the end time events of the rapture and then the tribulation that follows just be seven days away? Of course, I don't know that. But I think about things like this. How, how close Noah was to everything he knew about to be blotted out. And how fast our world, everything we know, is about to change. I mean, can changes in our world happen that fast? My goodness, just look at last year. I mean, you compare 2019 to the year 2020 and there's no comparison. Everything that was normal seems to have been altered. And if that can happen in the natural world, it could happen in God's dealings with man. And this is why it's so important to understand that today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, now is a day of salvation. Why would you gamble with your eternity given the direction that things are moving? And no doubt Noah had a message like that for his generation which was not heated. But you'll notice that when the flood comes, verse 4, the waters, now the waters coming out of the sky and the ground, that's your second number, 40 days and 40 nights. Don't confuse that with the length of the flood. 40 days and 40 nights was how long it, it rained. When you look at verse 24, end of the chapter, you'll see the flood lasted 150 days. And as as time permits, I'll show you that it, it lasted exactly five months, 30 days per month, which is sort of like how the Hebrew calendar works. And perhaps this is some sort of early rendition by the Lord of the Hebrew calendar. And you'll notice it's very clear about everything being destroyed. Henry Morris in his commentary on the book of Genesis, which I'll also recommend to you, says the words translated every living substance, there's the Hebrew phrase, mean literally all existence or all that grows up. And that's why everything after its kind had to be placed in the ark so that the world could be repopulated, finding this, following this, I should say, global deluge. And I'm here to tell you that the coming tribulation period is going to be just like that. It's going to be so severe that if it was allowed to extend beyond its seven-year time period, the nation of Israel and the human race would be on the verge of elimination. In fact, two-thirds, Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9, two-thirds of the nation of Israel is going to be wiped out. And half, Revelation 6, Revelation 9, of the world's population is going to be destroyed. It's going to be a time period unparalleled in terms of distress, Jesus said this concerning that coming time period. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. And if those days had not been cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Don't think that Noah has, is the only one with a severe message. We have a very severe message also to give to the unsaved. And we tell people, just as those in Noah's day could seek refuge in an ark made of wood, we tell people that they can seek refuge in the cross of Jesus Christ made of wood. Why is that? Because as severe as the flood was and as severe as the coming tribulation is going to be, the cross... As we get ready this week on Holy Week to celebrate or memorialize the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, at the cross, the sins of the world were paid for. 
flood, bad. Tribulation period, bad. The good news is the sins of the world have already been dealt with. And we, by seeking refuge in Christ by way of faith, can be spared from the wrath to come. We now move into the entrance into the ark, verses 5 through 12. Notice, if you will, Genesis chapter 7, verse 5. Noah did, according to some, oops, doesn't say that, does it? Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah's obedience, and this probably went on for over a hundred years, this construction of the ark. He did exactly what God told him to do. Right down to the seven day delay. If it had been me, I probably would have rushed into the ark too early. Noah doesn't do that. And he doesn't procrastinate and try to rush in after it's too late. He obeys God over and over again for over a hundred years. And this is why Noah was blessed of God. He did exactly what God told him to do. He didn't sit there and try to outvote God. He didn't second guess God. He didn't say, why are you doing this or why are you doing that? He didn't even trust his own Uh, five senses and the reasoning process God spoke and he did and he was no doubt laughed at and ridiculed by this antediluvian world who didn't even understand what the concept of rain was like building this massive structure called the ark he just got up every day went to work and he did exactly what God told him to do I am of the opinion that Noah was probably very wealthy. The reason I think that is he financed the ark. And Noah was willing to set aside human wealth and the allurements and the entrapments of the world to obey God. Everything that Noah had was about to be destroyed other than the ark which he created and the animals in the ark and his family in the ark. In other words, Noah is an example of a disciple of Christ. He's not just a man that trusts in Christ and has his fire insurance paid up and lives how he wants. He is a man that walks in complete and total obedience and dependence upon God. And and may we be more like that. May our, may our lives be like that. Rather than me always asserting my own free will against God, why don't I just do what God told me to, told me to do? And he's told me, told me to do a lot of things, hasn't he? It's in this book, particularly the epistles. And all of us know a lot more than we're actually putting into practice. And that's why many times our lives are not blessed the way Noah's life was blessed. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Noah put personal wealth on the back burner. And he put obedience to the things of God on the front burner. And how different things would have been if Noah's obedience was partial. If he got maybe a C plus or a B minus on obedience. I mean, human history could have been altered if he didn't do exactly what God told him to do. And it's the same in your life. If you don't do exactly what God told you to do, there are other people that suffer. It's not just about you, it's not just about me, it's about how God seeks to use you to bless other people, and if I don't do what he's told me to do, then it could have negative ramifications to other people as well. Remember Saul? He was told in 1 Samuel 15 to eradicate the Amalekites from under heaven, kill the animals, kill everything. And Saul really didn't do that. He spared some animals. They probably look like cute, cuddly creatures. 
Maybe Saul thought he could start his own zoo or something. And it, why kill the animals? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And so what Saul did to compensate for his lack of obedience is he offered a sacrifice. God will be happy with that, right? And do you remember when Saul was confronted by Samuel? Remember what Samuel said to Saul? To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. God is not interested in your religious rituals if you're using that as a cloak to hide your disobedience under. It doesn't matter whether you understand the ramifications and the meaning of God's command to wipe out the Amalekites, including their animals. This is not a vote situation that we're dealing with here. We are not running an opinion poll. Just do what I told you to do. Saul did not. He lost his kingdom as a consequence over the course of time, and God would not accept his religiosity as an excuse. How different Noah was. He did all that God commanded. And then you go down to verse 6 and it says, Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came upon the earth. Pay attention to that age. It's repeated again in verse 11. Because that's the last time you're going to see a number like that in the Bible. Until the kingdom comes. You're not going to have a a time period any longer where people are going to live into their 600s, 700s, 800s, 900s. Now, when Jesus establishes the kingdom, there will be people living abnormally long lifespans. Isaiah 65 verse 20, Isaiah 65 verse 23. But until that time period comes, the average age, according to Psalm 90 verse 10 that Moses would write about in the Psalms. Moses actually wrote a psalm. Did you know that? It's in Psalm 90. And Moses says in verse 10, As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or of due strength, 80 years. So you make it to age 70 or 80, you're considered fortunate in normal life today. But that's not what it was like prior to the flood. Noah lived... Prior to the flood, 600 years. Adam lived 930 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. But the flood changed all of that. That line in the middle is the the flood. And you'll notice how the ages of people starts to shrink after the flood. Here's maybe a more colorful picture of it if you're interested in that. Here's one more picture. The flood, generally by closed chronology, would be about 1656 B.C. And following that time period, I guess 1656 B.C., I'm not sure if that sounds right, but whatever it is, it was the flood did happen. And after the flood, the ages of people starts to shrink. It's a, it's a change in what's normative in life. The floodwaters brought that. It it terminated the anti-Diluvian age and initiated the post-Diluvian age that we're living in right now. It is interesting that our world has been changed as I speak today in the year 2021. It's been changed three times, radically. The first change was the fall which affected not just our relationship to the Lord, but the ground itself became difficult to eke out a living. Paul in Romans 8 personifies the earth and the universe is in a state of travail, longing for its liberation. Everybody today wants to talk about the environment and ecology. I'm here to tell you that the greatest environmental disaster that's ever hit this planet took place in Genesis 3 because of sin. And then the world, as we're studying here, is about to be changed a second time, right down to the ages of people, through the flood. And then it was changed a third time at the Tower of Babel, 
where ethnicities and nations and different languages developed, whereas prior to that, there was no such thing. And so think of the poor so-called scientist who's trying to make sense of our world and he doesn't consult the word of God. He can't make heads or tails of it. It doesn't matter how many PhDs he has after his name. You can't make any sense of geology. You can't make any sense of rocks. You can't make any sense of the age of the earth until you understand that the world that we're living in has been altered significantly three times. Now, once you start to study rocks and stratification and all of these kinds of things through the right grid, then all of a sudden you can make sense of it. But you can't make any sense of it without the light of God's word. This was why prior to Charles Lyell, who desired to liberate the fossil record from Moses, according to his own words, the leaders in geology were always Christians and believers in the Bible who took these things so. But you take away the Bible, you take away the right lens through which to understand these things. So the world, again, is about to be changed. And then you look at verse 7 of Genesis 7. You see eight people there on the ark. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. 1 Peter 3 verse 20 and 2 Peter 2 verse 5 are both very clear that there were only eight on the ark. So all of us owe our lineage in some way, shape, or form to Noah's three sons and their respective wives, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Because human history is about to, following the flood, continue through those three lines. And we know from Genesis 9 verse 26 to keep your eyes on Shem. Because through Shem's line, the Messiah is going to come. Interestingly, through the name Shem, we get the word Semitic. And we get an understanding that the Messiah is going to come through the Semitic people groups of the earth. We don't know about the Hebrews yet. The Hebrews don't exist yet. And so it's interesting how the Bible puts all of this information together for us. You look at verses 8 and 9 and it's sort of a review, if you will, of the animals on the ark and Noah's obedience. It says of the clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos Male and female, as God had commanded Noah. God knows what he's doing. We've got to put Mr. and Mrs. Animal together with each other. Because if we don't do that and pair them up, then how will those kinds be perpetuated in the post-flood world? Noah, who didn't even understand what rain was. Genesis 2, verses 5 and 6, that water came up like a mist prior to the flood and watered the ground, did exactly what God told him to do. He didn't obey God halfway, partially, 75%, but he obeyed God completely. And then I'm sure, he, I'm sure he's glad he obeyed. Because look at verse 10. It came about after the seven days. So the seven day grace period is over. The final call is over. It came about after seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. God said it would happen and it happened. One of my uh, favorite books in my library is this book here by the late John F. Walvoord. And you can see how ambitious the book is based on its title, Every Prophecy of the Bible. I mean, most people spend a book writing about one prophecy. He writes about all of them. And he shows over and over again the pattern 
of literal fulfillment. God told Adam and Eve, you'll die when you eat from that tree, tree of knowledge. Guess what? They died. And from that point on, he shows when God speaks, it happens. And this is how we know that prophecy, based on this pattern, is something you have to take very seriously. Because there are many prophecies yet to come that haven't been fulfilled yet. And yet they come also from the mouth of God. In 1994, Dr. Walbert was asked, what do you predict will be the most significant theological issues over the next 10 years? He responded, the hermeneutical problem. Now, hermeneutics is interpretation. That's the great battleground. The hermeneutical problem of interpreting the Bible literally, especially the prophetic areas. The church today is engulfed in the idea that one cannot interpret prophecy literally, close quote. This uh, insanity of non-literal interpretation of prophecy, that goes back to Augustine. In the fourth century, he wrote his book, the city of God, and he said a thousand doesn't mean a thousand. The thousand year kingdom is going on right now, he said. And these prophecies about they'll beat their swords into plowshares, I mean, that's not literal military peace. That's just talking about Jesus bringing his peace to the human heart. And that prophecy about the millennial temple and how there's going to come from the millennial temple in Jerusalem a river and that river is going to flow into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea will no longer be dead. It will start to teem with animals, sea animals and life. By the way, you'll find that in Ezekiel 47. What do you do with that one? Oh, that's, don't take that literally. That's just, you know, the soul that goes from death to life when you're saved. And this is the type of thing that Augustine started to introduce. This is what John Walbert is reacting against. If the prophecy of Ezekiel 47 is just about regeneration of the soul... then that would be outside God's pattern. Because God's prophecies are never fulfilled like that. God means what he says and says what he means. When he says it's going to flood for 40 days and 40 nights after this seven-day grace period, that's exactly what's going to happen. In fact, you can take it to the bank. And so if that's true for all of God's prophecies that have already taken place, which is what's demonstrated in Walvard's volume, you better take very seriously what he says of the prophecies yet to come. They will come to pass just as literally, just as accurately, just as reliably as anything else God has spoken. They have to, because God cannot what? He cannot lie. The book of Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. God, Numbers 23 verse 19, is, is not a man that he should lie. He's not a double talker. He doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. He's not double forked. He's not double tongued. What he says will happen. And how wise Noah was to build his life around those promises and their veracity. Even though he looked, no doubt, foolish. Until the seven days were over. The ark door was shut, as we'll see. The day of decision is over. The floodwaters begin to break upon the earth, like God said, and nobody's laughing anymore. Because God means what he says and says what he means. God cannot create a situation where he says something and then it won't happen or else that would violate his character. And if God is giving people grace today to get in line, they better take advantage of it. Because the day is going to come where that day of grace, this seven days that we see here, 
will no longer be an option. If you look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, we have a reiteration of Noah's age. In the 600th year of Noah's life, now look at this, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. You'll notice the beginning point of the flood is on day 17 of month 2. Now look at Genesis, if you could, chapter 8, next chapter, and look at verse 4. Then in the 17th, excuse me, then in the seventh month, on the 17th day, same month, same day. Actually, same day, different month, excuse me. Then in the seventh month, on the 17th day of that month, the ark rested upon the mountains. Now notice, it's not mountain of Ararat, it's mountains. So we don't know exactly which mountain it was. Because I watch these people on TV, they're trying to find Noah's Ark, and they're going to Mount Ararat, and I'm like, which one are you going to? The Bible says mountains. But it's interesting that the flood starts on the 17th day of the second month, and the ark will rest on the mountains of Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month. That means the flood lasted five months. It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but the earth was under this liquid deluge for five months. Now, Genesis 7 verse 24 says, the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So 150 days equals five months. That means we're dealing with months of 30 days. See, you didn't know math was part of all this, did you? Which could be sort of an early sort of Hebrew calendar that God is working with. I don't know. It's very interesting to observe all of this. But the specificity of this is interesting. And then if you look at verse 11, you now see the first rain in human history. It says in verse 11, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. These people didn't even know what a deluge was. They didn't know what rain was. Genesis 2 verses 5 and 6 talks about now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth and no plant of the field had sprouted for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Well, where did the moisture come from then before the flood? Verse 6 of Genesis 2. But mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. So if I'm understanding my Bible right, they had no conceptual understanding of a flood, of rain, of deluge, which made the whole ark project look absurd. And Noah's 120 years of preaching looked absurd. But the day in history came where the flood hit and you have the first rain in human history. Now if you look at verse 11 very carefully, you see the two sources of that flood. First of all, there's a subterranean source. Something is coming up from the ground. Um, it's called the fountains of the deep. And then it also said, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. That's source number two. Look, for example, at Genesis 8, next chapter over, verse 2, and you'll see those two sources mentioned again. When the 40 days and 40 nights came to an end. It says Genesis 8.2. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. And the rain from the sky was restrained. I don't know if I can make a lot of sense out of these waters from beneath the earth. But I think I can make some sense, and not everyone agrees with me on this. 
And if you don't agree with me on this, that's fine. You can go your way and I'll go his way. But I do believe, in, and a lot of the early young creationist movement, like Henry Morris, believed this, that there was at one time in history prior to the flood a canopy which surrounded the earth. And it sort of created a incubated environment, allowing people to live abnormally long and animals to grow abnormally large because that canopy filtered the sun's harmful rays. You say, where are you getting this from? It's in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, which we have already studied. It says, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were below the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. Now the expanse, that's easy, that's called the sky. And the waters below the sky is the oceans. What is sort of mystifying pardon the pun there, is waters above the sky. What, what is that exactly? Well, that's where this idea of a canopy that once surrounded the earth comes from. By the way, it's mentioned in Psalm 148 and verse 4, where it's talking about the various aspects of God. They're personified as praising God. And then it says in Psalm 148 verse 4, Praise him highest heavens and the waters that are above the sky. That's where the floodwaters came from. Now, is this something worth starting a new church over? Probably not. But it certainly explains a lot in the Bible, at least to me. It explains why early man was living so long. Noah, 930 years. Methuselah, 969 years. They were, they were living under that protective filter. Kind of a greenhouse effect. By the way, it explains strange beasts that we have no parallel today. Found in the fossil record. You get the impression that, that animals were living much larger in this time period. It explains where the floodwaters came from. It certainly didn't come from the rain. And it, exp it exp explains why following the flood, you don't have people living into their 600s or their 900s anymore. Now the lifespan is cut back to 70 years, 80 if you're fortunate. Psalm 90 verse 10 says, because the protective covering has been removed via the flood. It explains a worldwide flood of 40 days and 40 nights. You stand up today in a university classroom and you start talking about a flood that covered the whole world and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, you're going to get nothing but derision and laughter because the uniformitarian, somebody that thinks what's normal now has always been, will say oh, there's not enough moisture in the clouds for that kind of a deluge. Oh, so you're assuming God used the clouds. How do you know God used the clouds? Couldn't God have simply gradually released the canopy? Dr. Henry Morris in his commentary on Genesis says a worldwide rain lasting 40 days would be quite impossible under present atmospheric conditions. So this phenomenon required an utterly different source of atmospheric waters than now obtains. This we have already seen to be the waters above the firmament the vast thermal blanket of invisible water vapor that maintained the greenhouse effect in the antediluvian world. These waters somehow were to condense and fall on the earth. 
I think what I'm seeing here is the fact that God, when he designed the world via the canopy and the waters from above and the subterranean source of waters, designed the world to be detonated. All God had to do is put his finger on the proverbial metaphorical button and the detonation process would start. Which shows you that God is always sovereign over his creation. These people living in this time period gave no thought to God. But, but they were living in an environment where if God cho- chose to, he could detonate everything. By the way, do you believe in global warming? I'm here to tell you that global warming is coming to planet Earth. 2 Peter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now a thief, think about that. A thief breaking into your house at night is not a happy thing. It's something that takes you off guard. The judgment of God that's coming to this planet is going to take the human race off guard just like the floodwaters coming out of the earth and God releasing the canopy completely and totally took these people off guard. They weren't ready for it. They weren't preparing for it. Were they warned? Yes, they were. But they chose to not live or believe or think on the correct side of God. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. What I'm saying is just as the Noahic world was set for detonation, so is our world. It's just a matter of when God is going to detonate this earth. And why doesn't God move faster to detonate this earth? When you continue on in 2 Peter 3, you learn that he is long-suffering. Not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. We're living, folks, on borrowed time. Just like those in Noah's day were living on borrowed time. You know, there's a lot of people that will tell you, you know, I don't really think the flood covered the whole world. I think that's, and here's the fancy name they give for it. I think they say, they call it phenomenological language. Oh, that's how it seemed from Noah's point of view. He was in a boat, the boat was floating in a regional flood or a local flood. And when he looked out the window, to him... It looked like the earth was flooded, but we all know, hint, 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 wink, 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 the world was never flooded. And boy, I'm glad about that because I've already, my science teacher already taught me that the fossil record was accumulated in billions over billions of years. And if you start talking to me about a cataclysm, that the, out the window goes my interpretation of the fossil record. Now I've got to explain the fossil record in terms of a deluge. And by the way, there are things in the fossil record that to me, as a non-scientifically trained person, look like a deluge, where an animal is fossilized trying to consume another animal. And the spine is bowed back in an abnormal way. That to me does not like look like something that accumulated over billions of years. It looks like something that was going about life until judgment hit in a nanosecond. That's what it looks like to me. But people would contest that and they try to shrink the flood. That way they can still be scientific and believe in the Bible. So this, we're told, is phenomenological language. The problem is, when Moses is writing and Noah is an eyewitness to these things, he's talking about things that are outside the purview of his vision, isn't he? He's talking about something subterranean that you can't see. He is also talking about things in the heavens that are being released that you can't see. 
This is not phenomenological language. You know, everybody runs over to Joshua 10, 12 and 13 for a ex- uh, similar explanation of phenomenological language where it says over there that the sun stood still. Well, we know today that the earth revolves around the sun, so the sun didn't stand still. The sun looked like it was standing still, but it was the earth that stood still. So when it says the sun stood still, that's phenomenological language, right? And so people take that and they run back to Genesis and say, see, it's just phenomenological language. It's just what Noah thought he saw looking outside the window. And I'm here to tell you that this is not phenomenological language. Because he's not describing things that he could see. He's talking about things outside of the purview of his vision. Things deep beneath the earth and things far above the earth. No, this this flood hit everything on this planet. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and killed everything other than those that were in the ark. And the flood was so severe that it covered this world for five months, the water. And the ark didn't even rest on one of the mountains of Ararat until that five-month, 150-day period had elapsed. And what does Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5 say about these two doctrines? Creation and judgment. Peter, speaking of these things, and I think the King James here is a much better translation than the New American Standard. It says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. The New American Standard just says it escapes their notice. But the King James translates that Greek verb thelo which means wish or desire. For this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens of old were uh, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water and he goes on here and he describes not just creation but the flood. And those are the two doctrines that the natural man wants to get rid of. He literally wills them, 2 Peter 3, verse 5, King James interpretation, Thelo, he pushes them out of his mind. Now they use all these sophisticated arguments why they don't believe it, but the truth of the matter is they don't want to believe it. And the reason they don't want to believe in creation and the reason they don't want to believe in the flood is they don't want to believe that they are accountable to God as a created being. And they don't want to believe that God will judge the earth. And if God judges the earth in the flood, maybe he's going to judge the earth again. So they know these doctrines, but they fellow, wish, desire, push them out of their minds. It's an active process. It's Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, where the natural man sees the handiwork of God in creation and he actively suppresses the truth. In other words, you can be an atheist if you want to be, but you're going to have to work real hard at it. In fact, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night with your heart palpitating. Because at the bottom of your soul, at the core of your being, you know God exists. It's obvious God exists. But you don't want to talk about God as creator because it makes you accountable. And you certainly don't want to talk about a worldwide deluge because that shows that God intervenes in creation and judges. And if he did it once, he'll do it again. So all this debate about creation and the flood, it's an exercise of the will. The natural man not wanting to receive these ideas for fear of accountability. We'll conclude here with verse 12. The rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 
Sometimes I'm in a passage and it's hard to make a leap from that passage into the gospel, but today it's pretty easy. Just as judgment was coming and there was a way out in the days of Noah, we have that same message today. Judgment is coming. But the good news in it, and we call it gospel, good news, there's a way out. Because the sins of the world are already judged by Christ and his body on Christ, I should say. And if we will seek refuge in that ark made of wood, a cross of wood, then we're spared from the judgment to come. It's really that simple. Would you rather seek refuge in a, in a man, a God that paid the price for you, or would you rather be hurled into this coming time of judgment? Obviously, you'd want the former, wouldn't you? And so our exhortation to people here at Sugarland Bible Church is to respond to this message of salvation by accepting the free gift that Jesus died, as we memorialize it this week, died on a cross 2,000 years ago to give you. And as we reconvene next Lord's Day, we celebrate his bodily resurrection from the dead, which validated who he was. And he leaves the human race just with a simple message, which is to trust and what I've done for you as a free provision. And if you won't, then as the book of Hebrews says, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Becoming a Christian is not a 12-step program, it's one step where you don't have to walk an aisle, give money, join a church, pledge to do better, you just trust, and that's what we mean by faith. Trust in what Jesus did for you and the safekeeping of your soul. And the moment a lost person does that, they're under the grace of God. If it's something that you need more help with an explanation, I'm available after the service to talk. But it's something you can do even right now as I'm speaking. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for these first 12 verses of this chapter and how this is not just a history lesson but it's also a prophecy lesson because the flood is, is, is a type of the things yet to come and help us to be wise enough like Noah to receive grace now while the opportunity remains. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.